Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Justin Ho is the CEO and co-founder of Ride OS, a next generation platform marketplace and mapping service that can be utilized by ride hailing companies, OEMs, and governments to operate fleets of on-demand self-driving vehicle services. Justin was formerly the head of strategy at Uber's advanced technology division, where he co-led the ideation, strategy, and execution of its self-driving car and mapping business units. His team focused on business model structures, competitive strategy, long-range forecasting, analytics, M&A, and any initiatives that touch the product and technology. So, Justin, I'm excited to have you on. How are you doing today? Good. Doing very well. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm excited to dig into uh, your time at Uber and uh, what you've got going on with Ride OS. But uh, before we get started, I want to get you an easy question to start. So I'm curious to know, what's your favorite mode of transportation? My favorite mode of transportation which is probably not surprising, is ride hailing. Okay. I do think having the opportunity to be able to download an app, summon a car on demand, and have it show up has been a very magical experience. Taking away the pains of city driving and also dealing with some of the congestion issues as well. Yeah, and are you based in San Francisco? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it is amazing. I do feel like in certain cities and certain areas and I guess even certain situations, it does seem like ride hailing. Um, you know, I think for everyone, it's been very impactful. But I think especially like if you live in downtown San Francisco, it's like a complete game changer, right? That's right. As I reflect back upon the last 10 years and just what I was able to do in the city with a car versus having the ride hailing options, it's completely transformed the way that I can get around the city. And I myself have actually been carless mm. uh, in San Francisco for the last 10 years. All right. So you're a living case study. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> how long have you been uh, involved in, before we get into your time at Uber, how long have you been involved, uh, I guess, in mobility? Or was Uber your first job on the transportation mobility side of things? So I've been involved for about 10 years, actually. Okay. So even prior to Uber, I was working at investment banking and and a hedge fund actually investing in automobile stocks Mm. in other industrial type of companies, so Ford and GM. And what was really interesting was around that time, there was a small startup called Uber Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Lyft and Sidecar at the time that were starting to blossom. And it was transforming my own transportation habits. Uh, But I would fly to Detroit and ask a lot of these senior executives running the car companies you know, what are you going to do about on-demand transportation and ride hailing? Yeah. And the response at the time was, it's not going to work mm-hmm. in New York. It might work in San Francisco, but it's not going to work in New York. There's a great cab system, and it's not going to work in Detroit. And we've seen just how far these companies have come in terms of embracing the future of mobility. So I saw this disruption. I had a fortunate opportunity to meet with Travis at the time and ended up joining Uber uh, spent about three three years there and uh, have been uh, you know on track towards continuing a career in mobility ever since. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what do you think uh, kind of gave you that unique insight at the beginning to go and join Uber? Was it more the fact that you were studying it and, you know, sort of coming across it in your day job as an investor or were you, you actually using it? It sounds like you might have actually been using the product too as a consumer. Yeah, so I was definitely using the product Uh, call it an early adopter as a consumer, Mm -hmm. and it was just magic. I remember those first experiences of being able to touch a button and see a car appear and not needing to, uh, you know, call a cab and wait and and figure out whether or not it was going to arrive or not. You know, Uber and Lyft at that time were going to be there, you know, in five minutes, and that uh, that was really magical. Yeah. Interesting. So this sounds like this was around, I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now, so I'm sort of cheating, but it sounds like you started in Uber at Uber in May of 2014. That's right. That's okay. right. So these were so sort of the early days. Evolve. That's right. Yeah. And there was a second uh, trend that I was following as an investor, which is, uh, which was pretty interesting as well, too. Just the combination of you know, on-demand electrification and mm-hmm. autonomous vehicles. And Uber is one of those companies that I thought had the unique opportunity to bring those three trends together. 
Yeah, definitely. So I, I do have to say, I, I do have you beat by one year because on my LinkedIn, it says I founded the Rideshare Guy in April of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, one month, right? So I'm sure we were both That's looking amazing. at it and aware of Uber, you know, bef- or much before then. But uh, that is funny because I was thinking, I was like, wait, May of 2014. That, that sounds like the story I tell people when I started the rideshare guy, but I've got you by one month. So um, I think it's really interesting to sort of see that foundation and see that base because now the picture, you know, as we get into more of your story, I think it's going to make a lot of sense for people, you know, kind of the work you did at Uber and then the company you founded. So you know, talking about your time at Uber, what, what was your role? And, you know, we, we don't need to go over everything you did, but at a high level, what'd you work on while you're at Uber? Yeah. So I ended up joining Uber around, uh, you know, at that time around 2014 and spent over three years there. And I probably had six or seven roles during that time. It was okay. just a period of extreme hyper growth. Yeah. And there were two large divisions that I was uh, heavily involved in. Uh, the first one was figuring out Uber's long-term mapping strategy. So one of the things that uh, people often underappreciate about ride hailing is some of the foundational mapping technologies, mapping services like routing, ETAs, mm-hmm. um, pooling algorithms, you know, how the map looks on the display, search, um, you know, geocoding, some of these terms. And uh, one of my first initiatives was to partner um, you know, with Chris Bloomberg, who's now my co-founder, who's mm-hmm. the head of uh, map services engineering to figure out Uber's long-term mapping strategy. And we ended up uh, you know, working together with the leadership team there to figure out the mapping strategy and ended up building quite a sizable team uh, to work on those technologies that now power Uber worldwide. Uh, the second division that I helped to start uh, was actually its self-driving vehicle efforts. So surprisingly, when I came to Uber, there wasn't a very sizable investment into actually building self-driving technologies. So a few of us sat in a room and we did a lot of research. We called just about every roboticist in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up culminating in the formation of what's now the advanced technology group uh, in Pittsburgh in many locations around the world. Got it. Okay. So two pretty big uh, initiatives, I guess you would say. And uh, I mean, I guess to quickly dig in on the mapping. So just so everyone understands, I mean, when I look down at the Uber app, right, I think you're right. Most people are more concerned with, hey, why isn't this map, you know, accurate, right? Or, or where's my driver? Or, What's going on? Um, you know, that's typically, I think, how pe- when people think of mapping. But are you saying that you guys sort of built your maps from scratch, kind of like a Google Maps? Uh, and, you know, uh, I guess you call it Uber Maps or what was the, what, how'd it work? That's right. So they ended up becoming an Uber mapping team. Mm-hmm. And you'll see some acquisitions that Uber made in the mapping space, including some imagery assets from Microsoft and also Decarta. However, largely mapping is always a combination of different technologies that you might license and then also ones that you might build in-house. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the ones that Uber built in-house was you know, uh, estimated time of arrival engine, ETA engine. And the reason that's important Um, is because, you know, your ETAs uh, determine uh, which car gets picked up and which car gets dispatched. Mm -hmm. So when your ETA is uh, the number that you see in the app as a rider uh, is off, uh, is inaccurate from the actual amount of time that the driver is going to take to get to you, you might dispatch the wrong car, uh, resulting in wasted driver minutes and and lower driver utilization. Um, So that was, you know, one, one piece of technology that's extremely hard to build considering how many drivers and riders there are uh, in the world, but one that was an area of focus for Uber. Yeah. And I mean, I guess I will be honest because in the early days, you know, drivers, a lot of drivers sort of, uh, you know, made, made a little bit of fun of Uber's mapping system. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm talking to the guy who was working on it, but I think it kind of maybe highlights how big of a challenge the mapping system was. I mean, I know in the early days when I first started driving for Uber and even Lyft in 2014, 2015, I recommended to drivers not to use Uber's mapping system. I, I, I told them to use Google Maps or Waze because I found it to be much more accurate. Is that sort of a separate deal? Or is that kind of just highlight how big a, of a challenge it was to build out that product, especially early on? Uh, definitely, you know, I, I do think that's that's fair feedback. You know, I think Google Maps and Waze have really set the bar very high mm-hmm. uh, in terms of a navigation type of product, and they've you know invested and, and the technology is very complex to build as well. 
you know, one thing I will say about, uh, you know, Uber's, uh, you know, Uber Maps was it was able to build technology that was specific to the Uber type of use case. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, having the Maps product, uh, you know, in the app versus needing to switch to an out of app, which could lead to, um, you know, looking at the phone or some some type of dangerous situations. And I know the team is is still working very hard there to continue to take the feedback and improve. So, uh, the journey is not uh, done yet, but it's made tremendous inroads, certainly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's definitely a fair point. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why drivers told me that they liked uh, using Uber Maps is because you don't have that switching, especially when you're on something like an Uber pool where, uh, you know, you're kind of, con- it, it could be constantly switching back and forth between Google Maps and the app if you're doing multiple passengers. I know Lyft now actually integrates Google Maps into their app so that you don't have to switch back and forth. But yeah, it is interesting. Interesting to sort of see, um, you know, one of the things that I like to highlight to my audience and just people in general is that, you know, we might interact with a product and it might seem very simple, you know, it's just like a simple ETA, but there might be hundreds, sometimes thousands of people <laughs> working on some of these products and some of these teams behind the scenes. It is pretty amazing sometimes. That's right. And you did bring up a, a good point, um, which was just how complicated these technologies are. And I thought that would be worth spending just a little bit of time touching upon. Um, some of the engineering and technical challenges that come with, you know, building a product. And, and really at the heart of why this is such a challenging problem is because when you're trying to predict what's happening in the real world with regards to routes and ETAs and how the world is going to change, yeah. you're fundamentally are looking at a world that's always changing. You know, every second, if you look, if you had a, just a, imagine a screenshot of the world every single second and trying to mm-hmm. capture all those different changes all the cars, the buses, which lane that they're in, what's their speed, what are the traffic lights, what are the traffic signals, are there construction? And these are all dynamic moving pieces. And yeah. you add another layer of complexity, which is uh, you know, a lot of people uh, like to go out and um, eat or go to the gym, but oftentimes these small businesses are often changing. They might go out of business. So how do you keep that data you know, refreshed? How do you, yeah. how do you capture that data, make that refreshed? And then serve ultimately, you know, hundreds of millions, hopefully billions someday of people mm-hmm. um, with this technology. And there's this enormous, you know, data challenges and scalability challenges and reliability challenges. So it's a very fun space to be involved in because you'll probably never be perfect in the sense that yeah. we're 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 never going to be able to capture the real world perfectly. However, yeah. you know, given that uh, you just keep you know keep uh, improving the overall system. Um, in order to uh, try to capture it as accurately as you can. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like when you're at Uber, at a certain point, you transitioned over or started the the ATG uh, program and kind of basically started working on Uber's uh, self-driving vehicles. Is that right? That's right. That's okay. right. And, and so I think that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, the technology and, you know, but I am curious to hear from you as someone who was working at Uber, uh, you know, kind of at the time, what do you think sort of was the goal initially starting that and kind of where, where do you think it's at right now for Uber? So if you look at ride hailing and not specific to Uber, the ride hailing globally, one of mm-hmm. the biggest problems that ride hailing has is, you know, driver churn. Mm-hmm. And the reason is just because, you know, driving is a really tough gig, um, yeah. as, as you probably know better than anybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to drive in these cities, and sometimes the passenger experience is not that great, and it takes a lot of focus and, and concentration. And so driver churn being the biggest problem, um, and, uh, and, and, and really secondly, uh, you know, one of ride healing's uh, bigger issues also is just the, the cost of taking a mm-hmm. trip as well, too. Uh, you know, it still hasn't gotten to a point where the economics make sense with regards to replacing car ownership for many. Um, and so we started with this fundamental problem, first principles. You know, what is the problem with, with ride healing? And as we then went out uh, to go and scope the market, you know, we realized that, you know, the, the eventual solution to this problem was you could foresee a world with mixed fleets of human-driven vehicles and autonomous vehicles operating mm-hmm. very seamlessly. So once you come to that, once we came to that type of uh, realization that this is a real problem and this is a solution, the question then was, you know, how long is it going to take to get there, and what are we going to do about that? Yeah. 
And that's what ended up culminating in the start of the self-driving vehicle efforts. And uh, we ended up selecting Pittsburgh. Um, and the reason we mm-hmm. selected that was just because there was such deep roots to CMU. And mm-hmm. CMU had historically been such a, a world leader um, in terms of robotics type of technologies. So that's we ended uh, up- Carnegie Mellon? Or that's Carnegie right. Mellon? That's right, okay. Carnegie Mellon. And they also had a National Robotics Engineering Center, which was their commercialization hub, um, mostly mm-hmm. uh, building robotics technologies for you know, defense and industrial type of ac- applications, for example, for Caterpillar. And so we were mm-hmm. able to assemble a team pretty quickly, and they understood this vision of self-driving vehicles rolling off of the manufacturing lines straight um, into this idea of a, of a shared transport type of system that consumers could could use at a very very low price point and and we ended up you know starting division and, and making the investment and you know building the team up from there yeah yeah no it's really interesting to sort of hear from your perspective kind of why uh, you know this initiative i guess was needed at uber and sort of uh you know i think from there you know as as the i guess the people on the outside or the public watching you know we can kind of guess but nobody knows <laughs> for sure right and um you know i guess while well, i guess was there anything um you know sort of at your time leading that group or sort of that uh, you learned i mean i guess uh, what what is the status of it today i know you left but i guess maybe we can kind of end uh, your time at Uber there, but I guess why'd you leave Uber and you know where what was the status of the program when you left? Yeah, definitely. So after we made the investment in the self-driving vehicle group, I ended up taking a post there as head of strategy, um, mm-hmm. and and really that was you know involved in everything from you know the financials to the product planning to uh, the regulatory uh, to just you know competitive strategy um, for, yeah. for what that group could become. And I think the way to think about that group was you know they had a singular mission. And that mm-hmm. mission was to build, you know, the world's safest driver. And uh, to my knowledge today, uh, you know, they, it is still a very credible team. It's been through some ups and downs. Uh, however, mm-hmm. overall, it's still one of the leading teams and has so many you know, talented people that are working to make this mission a reality. I think one of the yeah. interesting observations, though, which came shortly after uh, starting the self-driving vehicle divisions was there was this period of about one to two years where it's like the, the rest of the industry just woke up all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> and you saw, uh, and, and perhaps they've been planning this for a long time. Yeah. Um, but you saw these companies, you know, OEMs, new transportation network companies, um, cities all start to embrace this idea of on demand transport, um, autonomous vehicles, and just start pouring in capital. And that mm-hmm. ended up in the in the culmination of you know many other self-driving vehicle groups uh, that have been started today. Uh, you know, Cruise, Aurora, yeah. Argo, and um, that's been one of the most fascinating trends uh, to observe. And so, as we look out, you know, sort of three, five, ten years, um, you know, we really, I, you know, we here at Ride OS, we really see two broader trends. The first one is new entrance to the market. So a lot mm-hmm. of the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers like Ford and GM, Volkswagen, uh, you know, Toyota, they, they, they quite frankly missed the boat a little bit in terms of human-based ride hailing. However, you'll note that yeah, many of these companies have invested very heavily into autonomous vehicles. And so we'll see what happens in the, into the future, but we do see an industry structure where two things may happen. Uh, the first one is that there may be new entrants to the field, as in new companies mm-hmm. like Waymo, Cruise, you know, starting their own ride hailing networks powered by autonomous vehicles at a cheaper price point. And so that's that's really one of the one of the trends that we see. Uh, the second one that we see, which is pretty interesting, is the emergence of a fleet operator. So you can envision there when we're starting to think of autonomous vehicles at scale, uh, there are these fleet operators that effectively buy and hold you know, hundreds uh, to you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of autonomous vehicles. And their job yeah. is to dispatch and, and route them um, across multiple transportation network companies. So whereas an Uber mm-hmm. may just be incentivized to serve its own passengers on its own network, this fleet operator right. may hold, you know, a cruise vehicle, for example, and want to dispatch mm-hmm. that across Uber and Lyft. Either one of those two um, uh, you know, I- industry evolutions 
um, there are technologies such as location tracking, dispatch, and routing that are at the heart of that. Um, in order yeah. for you know companies to start on-demand networks or in order to put autonomous vehicles onto existing transportation networks, you're going to need really, really, really good cloud software that can help them orchestrate those fleets. And, and that's what we're building here at RideOS. Got it. I mean, it sort of sounds like a lot of what Uber is doing now with their ride hail fleet, but in the potential or sorry, in the future, you could potentially have certain OEMs that are just, you know, coming in with the cars. You could have others that kind of want to operate it on their own network or across networks. And it sounds like um, you guys want kind of want to be that layer in between that can basically serve everyone's different needs. Um, so hopefully hopefully that's right. Um, but if not, feel free. I would love to uh, dig into RideOS and maybe you can give me the 30-second the pitch about uh, what specifically it is you guys do and uh, you know who you help. No, that's exactly right. If you look at you know some of the companies that do dispatching and routing very well, take Uber, Lyft, mm-hmm. and Amazon, a lot of these technologies are completely built in-house and not available for mm-hmm. other companies to use. So what we really want to do is we want to build tools we want to build that layer, Got it. and we want to become the you know, global leading cloud platform for location, dispatch, and routing services. And, mm-hmm. and we believe that by building these tools, uh, we'll, we'll help to democratize this technology and enable safe and efficient transport for all. Got it. That that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, definitely providing a valuable service. I think the one thing that stands out to me, though, is, um, is it too early, right? Because, I mean, there aren't any uh, autonomous vehicle fleets operating today. So I'm curious how you think about the timing. Yeah, so market timing is definitely a big risk in this industry. And it's going to take mm-hmm. a while. Um, I think the good okay. thing about our business... What, what What's going to take a while? Sorry, the, the actual autonomous vehicle fleets or to- actual self-driving cars? So... What's going to take a while is for society to see the scaled impact of these technologies. And in order to achieve that, we, see, we, we would need to see manufacturing um, timelines line up with the autonomous technology development together with regulatory timelines and then consumer adoption. Mm-hmm. And, we've, and, and we've always held this view that it's when those four timelines line up where society will really see that impact. And that's going to take a while, um, depending on what geography that you're in and how ready are consumers, and what, what are the regulations, and, and is the technology ready? I think yeah. the, uh, and, and you bring up a good point um, in that these technologies are gonna take a while, so for a business like us that you know is, is building for the future, what do we do now? And so about seven yeah. months ago, we actually launched, launched our first major product. It's the Ride Heel platform. And the Ride Heel platform actually serves either or both human-driven vehicles and autonomous vehicles. And it offers a suite of products that allow companies to do two things. The first one is very quickly start their own on-demand network, either human Mm -hmm. or autonomous, or they can leverage our backend APIs, some of the complex algorithms to further optimize their existing ride healing networks. And so what we've done is we've built this platform it does. It is differentiated in the sense that it can support the needs of both human-driven vehicles and autonomous vehicles. However, mm-hmm. we can still build a business um, in the interim. Uh, you know, given uh, it. it's going to take a while. Okay. I mean, there are competitors in this space, I guess, uh, you know, building ride hill platforms today, you know, you know, there's ride cell, which does similar stuff. And there's a lot of smaller players too. We've interviewed a guy named George Grama on the podcast before who, you know, basically white labels ride hill software. Um, is your product any different than some of those? Or are you guys kind of all competing in the, in the same space, I guess today with obviously, I think you guys are unique. And then I think you're one of the only companies that maybe, uh, you know, kind of plan for that AV future in the in the future too. That's right. So there's there's really two ways where in which our products are are different versus some of the companies that you might find out there. Um, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. I think the first one is we have built this with flexibility in mind. And so one of the core pieces of technologies that we've built is what we call a constraint based routing engine. And this is interesting because both humans and autonomous vehicles can use this, but in the autonomous vehicle type yeah. of use case. You know, we believe one of the ways autonomous vehicles will come to the world is initially in geofences, small areas having a certain set of capabilities. And so let's say an autonomous vehicle can't do unprotected turns and also can't handle construction zones on a lane level basis. 
Well, we would be able to give mm-hmm. this autonomous vehicle a different route than we give a human. And so we've built in with that flexibility mm-hmm. in mind. The second area where we've really excelled is in efficiency. And the reason why efficiency for transportation network operators and, and companies is important is because ultimately transportation is a game that's going to be won by you know a, a matter of steps. And every, every penny matters, every minute of utilization matters. And so yeah. we've spent a lot of work uh, developing proprietary uh, technologies utilizing state-of-the-art algorithms um, in order to help our customers improve their network efficiencies. In one of the uh, simulations that we ran, we had a customer that was operating a shuttle service on fixed routes. And we showed through simulation that going from fixed to dynamic routes they could actually operate a similar level of service for consumers with 40% less vehicles. And that's one of the, and, and mm-hmm. seeing data like that is one of the things that really drives us because we do live in a day and age where you know, software is, is very powerful and it can lead to further efficiency and, and optimization, you know, helping to return time to people and, and reduce congestion. And those are some of the things that really motivate us and the team here. Yeah, no, those are two good points. And I think the thing that stands out to me with efficiency is that, you know, the big difference in the future is that, you know, these folks are going to actually own the fleets, right? And care, (laughs) frankly, like care a lot more about their expenses, about their utilization, about every second versus today, you know, with two to three million Uber drivers. And I think that I'm uh, probably qualified to talk about, you know, how how little a lot of drivers, you know, care about um, some of the things like utilization. You know, I think a good example is when your Uber driver drops you off, a lot of times um, what we almost always recommend to drivers is to sit there and not drive down the block or, you know, not wander around aimlessly. You should really only reposition yourself if you're giving yourself a better chance to get the next ride. And most drivers don't think about that. But I think there are a lot of these, um, you know, opportunities to improve the efficiency in the future for sure. And I mean, I guess it just really matters a lot more too, like you said, right? If you have 100,000 autonomous vehicles, if you could increase the efficiency by 1%, that's probably going to be millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. That's right. And that's actually really great feedback, because one of the current features that we're developing as part of this ride hill platform is fleet rebalancing. And it's this idea, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless of whether or not it's a human or a self-driving vehicle, that we can help to, you know, direct and give guidance towards, you know, humans uh, even that are, and drivers uh, that would be looking to, um, you know, make more money, for example, on, on a trip and guide them towards, where then where's you know what's the highest probability place where they might receive the next pickup and uh that's one of yeah and and i think yeah and i mean frankly this is why i think that companies like ride hill companies like uber and lyft are gonna have a big advantage when it comes to you know operating an autonomous fleet because like you guys are doing right now they can test a lot of the stuff that's gonna you know there's so there's sort of the self-driving technology which you know i I don't think we want to dig into that's a whole nother podcast in Mm -hmm. itself but you know it's somewhat of a commodity product everyone's working you know a few different approaches okay uh eventually a bunch of people are going to have that self-driving technology but where i think you can, um, you know, maybe not create a moat, but where you can get a big head start is understanding the kind of ride hail operating system today. I mean, right now, Uber, I don't see them actually, and this is kind of what I want to ask you, I don't see them building a ton of products that are going to help autonomous vehicles in the future. I, I, I sort of see them doing some, but I guess like some examples would be, you know, when I'm picking up and when I'm picking up um, a passenger, that's like one of the most challenging times as a driver. So, you know, Uber and Lyft have launched these light up beacons and these different, you know, tested a bunch of different um, what they call trade dress to sort of help the passenger more easily identify the driver in the future. Right now, that still relies on a lot of manual input um, from the driver. In the future, though, with autonomous vehicles, right, like those passengers are going to have to figure it out. (laughs) And, you know, they're probably going to have been drinking and all that. So, you know, that's I guess that's an example of I don't know if Uber is, you know, testing these trade dress right now for like an autonomous future, but it's like an example of a product that, you know, could um, you know, help out an autonomous vehicle in the future. I'm curious to know what you think about those types of products or, you know, those software pieces. Yeah, I think you, that's, I think that's a fair characterization. And even though I'm a few years, you know, removed from Uber and, and, and Lyft, um, so I don't have sufficient visibility into what they're building uh, currently. 
I want. Yeah. Well, I guess even how you guys think about, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be the specific products that Uber and Lyft are building, but I guess, you know, that intermediary technology, right, that sort of like can now benefit ride hail fleets today, but also, you know, sort of build the base for an autonomous vehicle, you know, autonomous driver in yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So even though I don't have visibility, you know, one thing I will say is that uh, oftentimes, when, when companies are going through these hyper growth stages, they need to build products for now. And the, the reality is mm-hmm. that right now there's millions of drivers that are, that have their livelihood dependent upon some of these right heel um, platforms and they have needs and those needs are complicated. And, and there's very talented teams of you know, software developers and, and um, product managers and, and ops folks that are working on serving those needs and there's continued improvements. However, you're absolutely right to identify that there are a set of technologies that are going to be needed, especially if you believe in this idea of a mixed fleet with a portion autonomous and, yeah. and human drivers um, that need to be re-architected from a first principle basis with a, with a different set of designs and parameters. Routing was an example that we came to earlier. Yeah. Uh, the pickup and drop-off problem is, a, is another prime example. And so one of the things that human drivers do today is, and, and if you've, as I know, you've been a driver in the past and also probably a passenger many times as well, too. But a driver is doing so many micro optimization at the end to make sure that a passenger is safely delivered. It might be double parking. Yeah. It might move parking spaces in the case that uh, there's an emergency vehicle or a police car that's there. They may park on the other side of the street. And the question then becomes, how are autonomous vehicles going to be different? Is it okay for an autonomous vehicle to be double parked? Um, Is it okay for it to be across the street? And so you start thinking through these different types of of pickup and drop-off problems, something that's so fundamental. And and how is the identity for a a consumer, uh, for a rider, going to be verified with with a machine? And and that's where, uh, you know, we do think that, you know, starting to build those those types of technologies that can enable that type of mixed fleet future uh, today, uh, with with these types of first principles in mind, um, and and knowing that these technologies will take you know years and, and decades to create, uh, yeah. you know, that's really why uh, you know we started the company. Yeah. So are those types of, you know, I guess issues or challenges, things you're working on right now at RideOS, or is there more pressing uh, problems to to work on? It's a mix. It's a mix. So we do have, you know, several customers which are work, working on autonomous vehicle uh, type of ride hailing pilots. Mm-hmm. And then we also have human driven ride hailing services um, as well, too. So one Got of the it. challenges we have is balancing, you know, feature development. Uh, which features do we build mm-hmm. that can that can that, that we know are valuable for today, but will also be valuable for the future? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a good way to look at it. Are there any examples you can share of features that you guys are building today that might be valuable in the future since you sort of have that? It sounds like you have a mix of ride hail uh, customers today and, uh, you know, other companies are doing small AV pilots too. Yeah, so I would say that uh, side of street, a uh, constraint-based routing would be an example. And so, mm-hmm. okay. you know, we have a web tool. Uh, it's pretty neat because for uh, it allows operators to be able to go into a city from a bird's eye view and draw zones and, and operational domains where an autonomous vehicle can operate or can't operate. And then we also have tools that okay. allow operators to be able to specify, hey, perhaps this autonomous vehicle can't uh, drive on Market Street um, or it can't handle this type of turn mm-hmm. restriction. And that ends up being fed as, uh, as, a, as a constraint uh, to give autonomous vehicles different okay. routes. Um, but I think one of the broader reflections also is there's not that many autonomous vehicle consumer facing uh, pilots right now. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we continue to invest in this product because we know it's going to be important. But we also realize that it'll take some time yeah. for the market and customers to adopt it fully. Yeah. Are the are the companies that you guys are working with? Is it public information? We've, we've announced a few uh, partnerships. One is with Ford. And so we're working okay. with them on a variety okay. of mobility related efforts. ST Engineering is an interesting partner based out of Singapore. Uh, the, uh, what's interesting about them is they're both operating an autonomous vehicle bus, but they're also uh, working with mm. the government um, in order, and, and the government of Singapore is effectively building an eight to 10 year plan to reconstruct 
you know, three new towns that are going to be completely powered by self-driving mm-hmm. vehicles with the latest infrastructure to help mm-hmm. with these types of coordination issues. So we're working with them on this very long-term vision. And you know, Voyage is also another self-driving vehicle startup um, that we've announced partnerships yeah. with that's operating out of San Jose and, and the villages in Florida. Yeah. Okay. And I know they're one of the companies that sort of use that, uh, I guess, con- constraint based, right? If they're operating in the village, you know, they have sort of very, um, very, you know, kind of uh, not relaxed, but what's the right word? Um, minimal, you know, kind of constraints, I guess you would say versus, you know, like an open road or an open city, right? Since it's a closed off area. And, you know, I think there's only golf carts uh, driving right. around, right? That's right. We're very excited for that uh, customer to okay. continue to leverage our, our technology. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem like sort of your your sweet spot uh, right now in the kind of AV space is these pilots, you know, these these cities or governments that are working on the smart cities or, you know, kind of building things from the ground up. What do you see as uh, your kind of ideal customer right now and kind of going forward into the future? So the ideal customer right now would be, you know, first uh, on that, let's divide this into the human driven side and the autonomous vehicle side. So I think on the human driven side, our mm-hmm. ideal customer is, one that has problems today, as in they have problems with mm-hmm. um, you know, the overall experience, they have problems with efficiency, or they have problems with scalability or reliability, and they really need you know, some, some help, especially on the, on the back end mm-hmm. uh, with regards to you know, state management, where are the vehicles, where are the drivers, how do we optimize, how do we match these efficiently, and they can give us very quick feedback. And I think the re- the yeah. I mean, would this be, you know, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, Uber and Lyft are sort of the big ones today. I mean, are there other companies? I guess, you know, I know there's a few small ones, but I guess there aren't a ton of other others right beyond that. Or are you working with Uber and Lyft or just looking at other small ones? So actually, I guess? we pulled a list of ride hailing companies in the world about a few months ago, and there are dozens. Uh, okay. and, and new ones that continue to okay. come up. Yeah, there's def- that's true. There's definitely a lot of new ones outside that's the right. U.S. That's right. So uh, we've been working you know, globally with, with several different types of companies. And okay. Of course, we would uh, you know, love Got to work it. with Uber and Lyft as well. Um, and on, on the autonomous side, as you addressed, there are many different pi- pilots and really our ideal customers, anyone mm-hmm. that's looking to start operating self-driving vehicles as a ride-hailing service, even if it's just for employees. And that's really our sweet spot. We have yeah. just about as much experience helping partners to be able to um, manage uh, that different type of fleet and, and orchestrate it well. And we've had many different reps um, helping you know customers to to launch these types of pilots. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Well, uh, I really, really appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, sharing your time about Uber. Thank you for humoring me with all my questions <laughs> about Uber, since I know it's been a few years since you worked there. And also sounds like you guys are working on some cool stuff at uh, RideOS. So if people want to learn a little bit more about RideOS or see what you guys are up to, where's the best place they can go? Our website uh, is www.rideos.ai. And uh, my email is justin at rideos.ai. And Always welcome feedback, new ideas, and we're always hiring as well. Sounds good. Well, I know we've got a lot of uh, people, you know, I call them industry insiders listening. And I know a few people have gotten jobs off of listening to the podcast. So who knows, maybe we'll uh, get a couple interviews off of this and uh, appreciate you coming on, Justin. Thanks so much for your time and thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Cool. Take care.